Welcome to Vasm Assembly episode number six after Francis McCabe from Google in the last episode. For this episode, I again have an external guest. Meet Bailey Hayes from Cosmonic. We will talk about what Cosmonic does in a couple of minutes, but for a little bit over one year now, Bailey has been Cosmonic's CTO, the Chief Technology Office Technology Officer. Welcome, Bailey. Hi, thank you for having me, Tom. Yeah, um, I'm really glad that you joined. Um, so fun anecdote before we start. Um, when I was researching you for this episode, I of course used as a Google employee, obviously Google, and um, I searched for facts that I could find about you and what you do and what you uh, were up to. And um, there was this one moment where I didn't find anything. It was like, wait, she's a pretty popular person. <laughs> there should be stuff to find. And then I realized instead of Bailey Hayes, I had searched for Haley Bayes. So I just swapped <laughs> the first letters around. And um, that's the reason why I didn't find anything useful. <laughs> But after noticing that, um, because I know Bailey's and Haley's, so <laughs> that's the confusing uh, bit here. But um, yeah, anyway, so um, when you joined Cosmonic, um, Cosmonic wrote a really, really so like super nice blog post about you. And I just want to uh, quote a little bit. So Bailey Hayes has distinguished herself throughout the WebAssembly ecosystem as a patient, kind, and visionary leader. She currently serves as a director on the Bytecode Alliance Technical Steering Committee, steering committee and as the developer representative to the Bytecode Alliance board. She leads multiple work streams and contributes to many others. She has a deep empathy for the developer experience and tries hard to bring out the best in all of those around her. Wow, so that's quite an intro blog post. Um, I wish when I joined Google, someone would have written something like that about me. I didn't even get like, you know, anything. It was like, yeah, mm, Tom joined, here's balloons, get to work. So, wow, that's really cool. Um, before we be, before we dive into all the Bytecode Alliance mention, um, mentions, let's just briefly talk about Cosmonic. Like, what does Cosmonic do? Um, what kind of company is it? What do you do with Wasm? If you just want to um, introduce us a little bit to your company, Cosmonic. Absolutely. Cosmonic is made up of uh, WebAssembly evangelists uh, in a lot of ways. We uh, help uh, maintain Wasm Cloud, which is a CNCF project, which we can talk a little bit more. But one of our big wanna, things. Want to tell us what CNCF is? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's an open source foundation that contains a lot of the cloud native projects like Kubernetes and a lot of the other pieces that, that um, sort of are in that orbit. Uh, and Wasm Cloud is one of those projects that, that is inside the CNCF. It's currently sandbox, but it's moving through the incubation process right now, which is very exciting. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll have news to announce having graduated to incubating, um, at least maybe by a KubeCon, uh, which is in November, um, and also CloudNativeCon, and WasmCon, which is all um, November 11th, I believe. Yeah, I'll be there. Um, nice, awesome. So let's talk about Wasm Cloud a little bit. So um, Cosmonic presents itself as the universal application platform, which is not nothing. So that's quite a bit. If you are universal, that's <laughs> that's a, that's a lot. Um, and Wasm Cloud lets you build your app using reusable components in any language and write apps in the languages your team already knows. So that's a classic Wasm pitch here. Um, so it uses components and um, yeah, it lets you assemble your team's common building blocks in any language. So again, it's a classic WebAssembly um, uh, components pitch here. So can you just go a little bit into the details here? So like, what is, what is Wasm Cloud exactly? What makes it special? Why is it the universal application platform? Right. So when you write a WebAssembly application, uh, people who are familiar with WebAssembly would know that it's a sandbox. and uh, inside that sandbox, you can't do things like make network requests or it connect to a database. And so you need uh, capabilities and providers, essentially, to be able to link to it. And those come in through the form of imports on your WebAssembly module or component. Um, so when we talk about a WebAssembly application uh, inside Wasm Cloud, what we're really talking about is a set of providers, uh, so those things that let you connect to a database and let you make HTTP requests, uh, key value, messaging, all of those types of things, uh, to the business logic that people write uh, that is inside their WebAssembly components. Uh, what makes Wasm Cloud different is that we orchestrate that in a distributed way, resiliently and efficiently across any cloud, Kubernetes, data center, or edge. 
so that is um, what sets us apart, is that we include orchestration for WebAssembly components. So sometimes we call ourselves WASM native orchestration. And it's probably worth mentioning, um, so all this is about server, so it's not WebAssembly running in the browser, it's purely server, right? So there's there's no WASM from any of the WASM uh, cloud or from the uh, Cosmonic services that runs in the browser, does it? Well, uh, we do have a prototype JavaScript host that Ooh. extends the WASM cloud. Uh, we call it a lattice. That's like that, uh, you know, that mesh, that compute mesh that, that we create. And that's what gives us all of those illities of software um, to extend to the, the browser edge, uh, which would just be, you know, running in a tab and uh, connecting to our underlying framework, which is another CNCF project that provides that called NATS. Oh, very interesting. So you said this is beta? Uh, very prototype, but it prototype. does work. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Some of the things that we we use in it is uh, Jayco, uh, which is a Bytecode Alliance project. Um, and so with Jayco, we're able to take a component, kind of decompose it into something that will run really well in, in web environments. And it includes shims for sort of that JavaScript glue, which is kind of what I was talking about before about you know, you, you really have to have a bit of a harness for your WebAssembly business logic to be able to reach out and do other interesting things. So. Um, yes, uh, I would say right now the focus is very much on the back end and microservices, but also IoT and Edge. Uh, so you can look on the CNCF blog. We, we recently published a new case study with machine metrics for factory floor automation, uh, which is really cool. Um, so from small to large, <laughs> uh, data center to, to, to very edgy and IoT, that, that's our focus right now. Cool. Um, so we will link to the blog post in the show notes. Um, also, Jayco. Uh, I always pronounce it as JCO for some reason. Jayco. Okay. Um, I played with Hello World, and it was very interesting. I mean, um, it turned, I think, what was like a one, like maybe three liner uh, JavaScript application into a, I think an eight megabyte Wasm uh, module that had <laughs> a ton of connectors to all the components and stuff. So this is obviously before optimization. Um, but like Jago definitely is one of the more interesting um, tools here because yeah, I think the the entire components world started mostly on the server, so WebAssembly server world. And now there's this attempt or approach to bring it to the browser. Um, are you at all involved in, in uh, Jayco? I am involved in that. I am on the technical steering committee in the Bytecode Alliance. Um, my teammate, uh, Victor Adasi, uh, is someone who contributes to Jayco. Um, and inside Jayco, I, I guess we should break it apart a little bit what it is. It is it is a series of JavaScript component tooling, Jayco. That's kind of what it stands for, um, to be able to uh, go from taking JavaScript code and helping you compile that, transpile that um, into a WebAssembly component, uh, but also for being able to take a JavaScript component and be able to run it inside a WebVM. And right now, what that looks like is uh, essentially extracting a component. And inside a WebAssembly component is a core module or multiple core modules that are linked together. And uh, pulling those out and making that run um, inside the browser with JavaScript shims. And it includes shims for WASI P2. Uh, so like being able to communicate with the file system, uh, being able to have access to NetHTTP over like fetch, for example. All of those are types of things that are part of the Jayco SDK. Underneath what uh, gave you your eight megabytes um, <laughs> uh, was probably Spider Monkey at the time, uh, depending on when you when you used it. Uh, we haven't done a big announcement yet, but there's another project within the Bytecode Alliance called S Starling Monkey, and Starling Monkey uh, is a project started by Till Schneiderite. Uh, uh, with several different contributors also uh, participating um, from Fastly um, and Fermion, they are building out a runtime so that you're able to um, more efficiently <laughs> make a smaller uh, footprint there. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of a combination of, of what Fastly was doing on their computed edge and um, a lot of the superpowers that you get out of Spider Monkey, which is with uh, Mozilla Firefox. Fox's engine. So um, there's there's a lot of stuff there. You know, um, it's it's definitely a lot more than um, just a few shims, and it's uh, not competitive with Mscripten, but it's sort of an alternative take on some of the things that Mscripten does. 
Very exciting. Um, I think we scratched upon this a little bit in the episode with Luke Wagner, um, but I'm interested in your take as well. So in the browser, you, of course, have to operate within the constraints of um, the web, which means um, things like fetch, where in the server, you can just fetch anything. Um, in the browser, you have course, so you can only fetch course-enabled resources and stuff. Um, file system is kind of limited as well. So um, there's some approaches that um, the like at Google, we call it Project Fugu. Um, so web capabilities where you get access to um, the file system, the actual file system, so you can write, read and write files. Um, but I, obviously, also, this is not super um, like universal in a sense that some browsers don't support the API yet. Um, then others may have yeah very yeah, like uh, limitations to what what kind of files you can access. So like. It opens up a little bit the sandbox, but not really. So um, I'm interested in just hearing your your thoughts on what is the difference here between security sandboxing when it comes to server versus um, running in the browser. Yeah, so your web VM is really the one that's on the hook for providing the sandbox for the WebAssembly runtime that runs inside that VM. And so, as you said, the way that the web VM does that, it shares what JavaScript's uh, essentially sandbox limitations are through cores, through the ways that it allows you to interact with things like um, local storage or creating uh, worker threads. Um, uh, that is different on the server, uh, but in a lot of ways, it's similar. So on the server, it is your WebAssembly runtime, and the piece that embeds that runtime is on the hook for being the one to provide that sandbox. And so uh, you could uh, implement the fetch uh, in, in terms of cores on the server side. Um, that is up to the embedder. Um, we, within the WASI subgroup, are coming up with interfaces that are meant to be capability-driven and that if I give you a function handle to this interface, uh, you have access to it. So I'm giving you a capability, like I'm giving you the ability to call fetch uh, through WASI HTTP. Um, if, uh, if I, as I, at the way that I give you that, um, I can implement that with a number of different things that, that on my side. So uh, within Wasm Cloud, for example, um, we uh, virtualize things like file system. Um, so it's in memory. Um, we disallow sockets uh, because a lot of people are running these in more server side environments. So um, when we do the way that we see this in production is that people put things like Cilium uh, around the embedded uh, deployment. And that is a way to um, provide sort of like a firewall and networking level policy roles. Uh, you know, make sure somebody doesn't get access to your cube API, for example. Um, so similar um, in a lot of ways, uh, web VMs have superpowers in that they've been working on this sandbox for 20 years <laughs> and more. Um, and we're, we're doing a lot of that right now as emerging technology within the WASI subgroup. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. So um, I want to just emphasize a bit more like the differences between um, running on a server versus running in the browser. So in the browser, if you want to get um, external resources, you have XML HTTP request, you have fetch, um, you have pretty much full degree of freedom. You can, for example, set random headers. Um, if you run with uh, something like the um, Vasi, what is it, network interface, I think is the name, um, do you have this this freedom as well? Or like, how does it work there? Yeah, we actually used a lot of the web engines uh, testing suite and also Fastly's testing suite for being able to make HTTP requests for modeling WASI HTTP. Uh, so um, you will see, uh, I would actually argue, fairly low level implementation of the HTTP API uh, inside WASI HTTP. Um, and, and part of that is why we're seeing WASI HTTP be mapped to things like fetch, so that you have sort of a higher level, more uh, user-friendly interface for things. Um, and so within other ecosystems, like when compiling to Go, uh, there's essentially a net HTTP equivalent uh, that that um, is bound to the actual WASI HTTP interfaces. So you're able to write normal, you know, Go that you normally are used to, uh, idiomatic Go. Um, and when you target WASI P2, what comes out is something that's actually targeting the WASI HTTP API. But you were able to say, you know, client Git, <laughs> which is nice. Um, 
So yes, you, you have access to setting headers and, and all of the above. And you can use all the HTTP methods, I suppose, maybe even like the more esoteric ones, like a patch, for example. Does that work? Yeah, go for it. Um, but uh, we we set uh, essentially enums in it. Um, so you have uh, all of this is defined with wit. Uh, that is essentially an IDL uh, that is for WebAssembly components. It is um, you know a way to strictly define your interfaces. It gives you high level types like strings, which um, if you've been talking to people in the WebAssembly space for a while, uh, when you are usually compiling your code and you're targeting a WebAssembly module, you have different bind gen interfaces between all of the different languages. Um, you know, the way that I implemented it with C++ about a decade ago now um, uh, was to uh, essentially have a, a concept of sort of a closet with an index. And, you know, like I, I, I had to convert everything essentially to numbers uh, equivalent for a string and, and then back again for the bindings uh, for that language. Uh, all this to say, with WIT and the canonical ABI that's part of the component model, we now have a standardized way of being able to lift and lower types between your core WASM types, bunch of numbers, uh, to something that's high level um, that other languages can target. And uh, part of, of why that has to be sort of defined is that the representation of, let's say, a Python string uh, compared to a Rust string is actually very different. Um, so you need a way, if you're going to have these two things talk to each other, to lift and lower those types uh, and, and get back to um, something that's canonical. And that's why it's called the canonical ABI. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, th I think this references some of the nightmares that um, we had uh, discussed with Ryan Hunt when uh, I had him on the episode, what was it, four or five? Um, four, I think, um, where we talked about uh, built-in strings, uh, string ref. Um, I think this is phase four now. Um, I think back then it was only phase three, if I rem remember correctly. So yeah, like strings, super nightmare. And it sounds like you were part of the nightmare in implementing it uh, a decade ago in C++. Yeah, and, and that was just spe specific to one language, right? And uh, what we're able to do when somebody is uh, defining their WebAssembly component with WIT uh, is that they can bind to it from any language that supports uh, essentially a wit bind gen uh, style language generator. Uh, and today that's like, you know, TypeScript, JavaScript, Go, Rust, C, C++, Python, C Sharp. Um, um, so a lot of your, your major and most popular languages. Um, now, ex the, the extern ref string problem is really specific to exposing JavaScript web mm -hmm. strings, um, whereas these strings are actually uh, UTF-8 strings, um, which allows us to have that like polyglot language binding. Um, so only slightly different, but very similar types of problems. Um, and, and what that basically meant is that my C++ module that I wrote, you know, forever ago, like only me and my framework and my code was able to interact with it and other people could understand it. And, and now what we have with like the WebAssembly component model is that I can take multiple components. I don't care what language they were written in. I can compose them together and have them talk to each other uh, without any issue, which is really amazing. And, and all of that was a long-winded explanation for if you want to check out what you're able to do with WASI HTTP, you can go to GitHub WebAssembly WASI hyphen HTTP, and you can read a WIT spec for, for all the things that are available. And um, it's... Uh, again, a little low level, like you're going to see things like trailers and all that kind of stuff in like your high level, you know, incoming requests and outgoing requests. But, um, uh, and if you don't know what trailers are, it's kind of like headers, but <laughs> at the I'm end, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, that, I guess that's kind of the point is if you never heard of trailers, now you know what I mean when I say it's a little low level. And I guess, uh, as a, as an implementer, um, you need to care about this, but as someone who just uses the command model, um, that's just part of the whatever eight megabyte VASM that you get or four megabytes or two megabytes or whatever. Um, because the, um, the component model would just take care of, um, compiling all these, like low level nightmares away for you. So you can just connect your Rust BASM module with your C++ BASM module and just have them pass strings from one to the other and just forget about all the internals, right? Right, yeah. And so in addition to uh, strings, which I, I highlight just because I have old, uh, old memories there, but 
Um, we also support variants, which are kind of like a type of enum. Uh, also records, which are sort of like structs. Um, so it's like a lot of different high level types and, and you can define some of your own types. So um, if you want to provide a link in the show, na- show notes, I'll, I'll drop a, a link over. But um, essentially inside WASI HTTP, there's a variant for method and you've got all the get head post put all those types of things. But as you said, somebody else is going to be building with an SDK or their standard language library and for what they're used to. And when they compile, that's what's going to map to, to, the, to these types, um, typically with bindings. But actually, a lot of people are providing direct like WASI libraries inside the STLs now, um, which is great because that makes it things a little bit more ergonomic for folks. Yeah, we will definitely link to this so people interested in this can explore, um, play with it in the browser, on the server. It's very fascinating. Still pretty new, at least to me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But there's a lot of progress. Um, we, uh, I think, touched upon, was it? Yeah, Luke, Luke Wagner touched upon um, the VASI 3 um, preview that is, I think, already in development. So there's a lot of uh, work happening there, right? Oh, so much work. So uh, for for folks, we had WASI Preview 1, which came out, uh, I think, December 2019. Uh, I held the vote for WASI P2. We actually decided to drop preview since it was uh, giving people the wrong impression. Um, uh, we, we are calling it P2 because what we're essentially doing is moving to semantic versioning. We have stable releases that are non-breaking that people can adopt and they're adopting in places like standard language libraries where there's many, uh, years of support, uh, uh, applied. So, um, very stable, um, although still a proposal. Um, and, and the, the preview word, uh, is really kind of like more of like a W3C standards thing, which doesn't mean a lot to developers, but they know what, uh, O.2 means, uh, in terms of semantic versioning. So, um, WASI P2, uh, that vote was January, 2024 this year. Um, and we're targeting basically Q1, Q2 ish for, for WASI P3. Um, the main difference between WASI P2 and WASI P3, WASI P2 introduced the component model with uh, WASI HTTP, you've got access to sockets finally for, for WASI folks, um, along with all the other things that we essentially provided in, in WASI Preview 1. Um, WASI P3 introduces native async. And that's going to be really powerful for people to be able to write async code and compose components together that are also doing async code. Um, so th- I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, Luke's Luke's very much the architect of a lot of that work. All right. Um, before we dive do too deep into this rabbit hole, um, let's uh, start a little bit higher because you are very active in the Bytecode Alliance, and you just mentioned W3C standards. And actually, at the Bytecode Alliance, as we learned from the Cosmonic Intro blog post, you have two roles. So you are on the board, and you are also a member of the Technical Steering Committee. Um, what is the difference between these two roles? Sure. Uh, so the Technical Steering Committee of the Bytecode Alliance, uh, we ensure that the technology that we're building uh, aligns with our mission and principles. Um, for us, that is essentially building in the Bytecode Alliance. It's a nonprofit software foundation for building secure foundations for WebAssembly based on WebAssembly standards. Now, it doesn't th- that blanket term for standards doesn't just apply to the W3C WebAssembly. It also applies to TC39 and other different standards bodies. We work with um, multiple wherever ac- applicable. Um, and so my role in the TSE is uh, aligning a lot of our projects around that work. So we're doing implementations of those standards. We're not defining the standards themselves. And then I represent the TSE on the board. And so the board is the acting body that manages budget and um, finds places where we can hold uh, events for our contributors and developers. and. Um, we, we also try to find ways to communicate, like you, you've you highlighted uh, before, I believe that um, I've written a few different blog posts for the Bytecode Alliance, um, like trying to project out what our roadmap would be and when we would release WASI P2 uh, implementations. And uh, I think that's been, it's been a real joy to, to serve in that role. Awesome. Um, so we actually met the first time at the VASM 
a CG community group meeting in Pittsburgh. So you're also active um, in actual VASM standardization. At the same time, you are active, as we just learned, in the Bytecode Alliance, um, working on implementation. Um, I just want to quickly thank uh, Deepti, who we had on the second episode, for uh, introducing the two of us. Um, so thank you, Deepti. Um, yeah, so if you just want to very briefly look at Bytecode Alliance and um, the W3C working group, but also the community group, it's like three different bodies, but all sort of work together. So. The standards can't live without implementations because it's um, a requirement for some of the phases. I think starting from phase three, if I recall correctly, you should have or need to have an implementation. And this is where the bytecode alliance then comes in. Um, like, how how even does does all this coordination between the different groups work? Is it simply people sit on all different groups at the same time? And uh, like that, it's not really different groups. It's just on paper a difference. Or like, how does it work? Yes, uh, you do see some of the same faces and places, uh, but we we definitely are in different contexts uh, in those places. So I am one of the chairs for the WASI subgroup, which is a subgroup of the W3C's WebAssembly CG. Um, with, I personally don't champion uh, any of the core specifications right now for uh, the WebAssembly core spec, but I, I do have a few that I work on for WASI. Um, and that is definitely influenced by also being a maintainer on WASM Cloud, which implements a lot of these things as well. So um, those implementations technically are also in the CNCF, not just happening within the Bytecode Alliance for, for these APIs. Um, an example would be uh, WASI Runtime Config. Um, that actually was first implemented within WASM Cloud uh, before being brought up into WASI. So we started with an implementation, felt right, uh, and then moved forward trying, working to propose it and have it adopted across all of these other folks that are implementers um, in the space. So working within uh, the WASI subgroup is very helpful because there are people like CNCF WASM Edge, which is another WebAssembly runtime that's in the CNCF, uh, who is adopting um, WASI P2 in the component model. So we coordinate there. Um, versus coordinating over in the Bytecode Alliance. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I So as as chair, mostly I'm, I'm uh, making sure that we're following procedures, asking people to come and present when I know they're working on something interesting that for the group uh, and um, sort of keeping things moving along in those meetings uh, and making sure that uh, we reach our goals. Um, now... I definitely then oversee making sure that we are providing good implementation feedback for the proposals that are that are showing up within WASI because uh, standards not very useful without a real implementation proving that it's going to work out and be okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope that explains it. I realize that there's a lot of similar hats, but I would say the component model, uh, a lot of that design is happening within the uh, WebAssembly GitHub org. And so you'll see folks like Francis McCabe, um, Andreas Rosberg, and Luke Wagner coming up and building out a lot of the specification and design for those things. Uh, and then you'll see folks like Alex Crichton, myself, uh, Pat Hickey chiming in about implementation, like, hey, tried this, had some weirdness, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, so so you'll definitely kind of see a little bit of a distinction between um, specification, design, and writing, and and a little bit language design with component model, actually. Um, and, and and then on the implementation side from both, both a guest producer tool chain, so the side where you're talking about upstream languages like writing in Go and, and JCO, uh, or on the runtime side uh, for, through Wasm Time um, or uh, embedders of Wasm Time like Wasm Cloud. Hmm. Um, I want to construct an example here, and um, it's constructed by, by force. So just wanted to hear your take. So let's say I'm an academic. Um, I am, as the cliche goes, not a great engineer. I'm just a great researcher. So just very much scare quotes here. Um, I'm a great researcher. I have this amazing idea of how to bring WebAssembly forward. So I create an implementation that is uh, not up to production standards. Um, could I then say, hey, Bytecode Alliance, um, I have this non-engineering, non-prod ready implementation. Can you take this and make it prod ready so that people can actually build startups upon this new idea? Would this be something where the Bytecode Alliance could be 
you know, almost like tasked to work on something? I would say that what we would aim to do is find an industry partner within the Bike Cut Alliance that has a need for that use case. So that's really how you get something to production is having real end users in production using it. So I, the way that that actually, there's a few examples of this happening right now. Um, there are a lot of different master's students who are very deeply interested in hardware and expanding the WASI landscape to include uh, hardware uh, APIs like I squared C. Um, so the way that that's worked is they have made a reference implementation um, that was very lightweight. Uh, and then they've been working with uh, folks within a special interest group within the Bike Code Alliance to find industry partners and folks that are interested and excited about it and kind of rally that engineering effort uh, to build out something uh, for the right runtime and for the right users. Um, so that is essentially how that works in that it's, uh, you, you propose, you share your ideas, uh, um, definitely showing up with a reference implementation is uh, ideal <laughs> um, uh, versus writing a, a, a WIT definition. That's not as helpful just because uh, there's definitely a lot of tricky bits uh, when it comes to implementing things and, and being able to see it essentially work the way that you desire is, is really important. And more than anything, we are essentially looking for uh, an industry partner to, to bring things all the way over the line. Um, the way that that works inside the core WebAssembly CG is that person is usually the browser, <laughs> obviously. Um, so Google Chrome representative, or like you, you mentioned that you've interviewed Ryan Hunt, uh, so representative for Firefox. Um, that's all very important uh, to have. Um, and so it, it sort of works naturally within uh, the core WebAssembly CG and a little bit, um, a little bit more of where I, I do a little bit of matchmaking where I say, oh, hey, you're working on something really cool. I know Siemens is really interested in this and, and do an intro and, and and try to get those things moving together with, um, yeah, real, real production use cases. So to continue the constructed use case a little more, so let's say um, I have this great idea. I talk to the Bytecode Alliance, um, but the Bytecode Alliance failed for whatever reason to find an industry partner to do a production-ready implementation. So I'm this uh, genius master student. And, um, yeah, I have my hacked together reference implementation. Can the proposal then still proceed in the standards phase, like uh, move up one level and be become phase four? Or do you actually require some sort of, uh, it has to be a real implementation, not just a toy implementation. And I guess defining what is a toy implementation, what is a real implementation is kind of hard. Um, but like, is, is there any kind of requirement to say like, hey, um, someone should seriously be looking into implementing this before it, we, you can pass it on to the next phase? Yeah, so the the sort of backstop there, we don't fully prescribe uh, what is real and what isn't real. That's kind of a hard thing to do in, in software totally, yeah. where most things are kind of not real, actually, you know, they're just kind of <laughs> things we invented in our minds and we gave them silly names because they kind of map to something in the real world. But um, we, we drive all of our decisions by consensus inside the, the WASI working group. So I would... I said working group, I meant to say the WASI subgroup. Um, but within the WASI subgroup, I think that it would be hard to reach consensus on something that is um, n not applied uh, generally, because it's a lot of work to maintain uh, essentially a standard in a proposal. Um, what we really don't want to see is a master's student propose a thing, get their thesis done, and then disappear. Right, we we want to we want to make sure that this stuff is going to be championed all the way through. Um, so I think that the consensus backstop for the the group would probably keep that from moving forward. Yeah, which I guess makes sense. And um, if the proposal is truly interesting, there should be someone implementing um, from the industry partners. So that makes sense. Um, so. Looking um, for traces about you online, something that I found was the updated developer roadmap 
in the Bytecode Alliance from 2023. And um, then also you run a YouTube channel with uh, Bytecode Alliance updates about several work streams. Um, do you just want to tell us a little bit uh, what work streams you're active in, what um, enthuses you about these work streams, what's kind of interesting, maybe something, what is what is, bo what is a boring work stream you're involved in, but you just have to because it's important? Um, like, yeah, just tell us about work streams in the Bytecode Alliance that you are working on. Yeah, so I, I I pop into most of the special interest groups. Um, I rally resources behind the most important problems that I see that we need to solve immediately. Um, uh, any places where there's pain points and, and we're kind of stuck. So uh, my work streams are often not as technical other than technically understanding what, what needs to be done. Um, Which is super technical. But but also uh, aiming to uh, work across the industry and sort of uh, help set priorities. I think a lot of people don't realize that the way that open source development works is it's based on trust and relationships and knowing when somebody is working at a different company who, um, you know, who has different uh, requirements, different deliverables and deadlines um, and goals sometimes. Uh, to know that you're going to work with them and when you say you'll get something done that they're depending on you'll do it uh and that you know hey i'm willing to invest this month on this problem are you then we can move 10 times faster because we're both available and and focused on this problem um so uh some of the things uh, that i'm working on that <laughs> maybe that's not as uh interesting to other people but um, is setting up our release automation for a lot of the projects that we have in the Bytecode Alliance, um, popping into uh, getting those final release artifacts, which actually is super fun uh, when you create the first release for something for Componentize.net, working with James Sturdivant, who created that project, which is the SDK like Jayco, but for C Sharp and .NET. Um, so that was really cool to do in the past month. Uh, we... Um, uh, I, I just rallied this for the Go work actually yesterday. Uh, kind of the same thing, but you know, with Go, they don't really like to have a thing that's like an SDK, so you can't really say that word. You gotta like whisper it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> have modules there that um, everybody can import and and use as a dependency for for getting some of your WASI APIs, making tooling really nice for doing the bind gen stuff that's idiomatic instead of the rust bind gen that wrote go code out um that bind gen wasn't as idiomatic go as as it could be so uh now we've got a go native version of that created by randy reddick which is awesome so i've been partnering with randy to to create the github project get all the vanity url set up all that kind of stuff um so so that's just a, a small smattering of things there's there's lots and lots and lots of things like that in the space i um, I also, uh, one of the work streams that uh, um, I'm doing also from the governance side is defining the hosted and core requirements for the Bytecode Alliance. Um, so I got to meet with a team last night with Whammer, who is a project within the Bytecode Alliance, and we um, uh, got to collaboratively review those requirements um, and, and work through some of that feedback. And then I'm folding that back in today and, and looking for another round of feedback, that kind of stuff. So. Um, that's an example of, you know, working with folks all around the globe. So for me, that was a, a late night evening, but I think it's one of the coolest things that I'm privileged to get to do is have the world be my coworker. So, um, it's kind of awesome, uh, type of role. I glue things, <laughs> I guess it's a, a long, a long winded summary. I just glue things. That's, that's one of the things I do. Well, so looking at, um, how, what you described would map to roles at big companies like Google, I think you're doing several roles there. So there's product manager, there is um, developer relations, there is engineer, there is partnerships manager. So like, there's so many connections that you need to have and so much knowledge that you have ac accumulated and still, I guess, on a daily basis need to accumulate um, to connect all those people, all those work streams, all those projects um, and see where where's a good fit. Wow, that's really impressive. Um, so you just mentioned um, Vammer and um, I came across Vammer um, when I looked at the Bytecode Alliance projects. And interestingly, there's four only listed on the web uh, site. Um, so if you go to the website and uh, look up the, the projects, there's VASM Time, um, the fast, secure, standards compliant runtime for WebAssembly. There's CraneLift, a production ready, low level, retargetable code generator. 
There's Bammer that you just mentioned, the WebAssembly micro runtime, lightweight standalone interpret interpreter-based WebAssembly runtime, and there's JV, JavaScript to WebAssembly toolchain designed to execute JavaScript on WebAssembly. But to my surprise, there is no mention of Vasi at all uh, as a as a project. And um, a lot of the um, bytecode alliance work that I see, at least, um, and I'm not super involved, uh, obviously, is uh, around Vasi. So why is Vasi not listed as a as a top level project? Is it, is it just an oversight or is this a deliberate choice? Like, is the website just need uh, in need of an update? What, what's happening there? Yeah, that's a great question. It is a deliberate choice. Uh, WASI as a project is very much owned by the W3C's WASI subgroup. Uh, so there we we um, we host the the documentation for WASI. Um, but anybody can be pushing that forward. So that is not a project that Bytecode Alliance could own, although we we do spend a significant amount of um, our implementation points on, on, on that, but it's it's not exclusive to just WASI. That's just one of the things of, if you're, one of your core operating principles is to implement WebAssembly standards, then that's one of those that you do. Uh, we do host the component model book, uh, so that's another project that we have within the Bytecode Alliance, and that shows how to use the component model and WASI APIs uh, with a lot of the different Bytecode Alliance projects that we have. Um, so the projects that you enumerated, uh, those are sort of flagship projects. Um, my hope is that a lot of those will become core projects to the, the project's requ uh, requirement uh, specification that I was working on. Um, a corollary to that is that other uh, open source foundations like the CNCF have a concept of moving between graduation stages. Um, and so right now we have lots of hosted projects. Uh, we have the, the flagship projects that we highlight on our website. Um, but what we'd really like to define is the set of core projects. Um, and so technically we don't have any of those right now, but you could guess which ones that we're really hoping to be the first ones uh, based on the website. Hmm. Um, and so uh, the work for WASI and for the component model would not live in any one of these individual implementations. Um, you know, there's, I'll just name a few things that we have. A lot of that work uh, for parsing a, a component model, um, the ABI, a lot of that is inside WASM tools. WASM tools actually is a collection of a number of different types of libraries and is also a CLI that a lot of folks use. Um, there's the bind in generators. That's another kind of project that we have, uh, obviously that um, builds out for WASI and WIT and uh, cargo component is kind of like the JCO, but for uh, working with Rust projects. It's a little, it's 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 not as uh, as complicated as what you have to do for for converting JavaScript to a component. Cargo is very smart about wrapping existing things that are in the the Rust ecosystem and just uh, calling it through so that it feels like you're you know you're dealing. It's cargo component. So how do you interact with cargo? But like for components, um, that's sort of that project. And so, anyways. Yes, you're, you're totally right that a lot of the different hosted projects have overlap here with WASI and the component model implementations, but as a project that lives and breathes, it's definitely uh, over on the W3C side. Hmm. So looking at um, some of your websites there, there's wasi.dev, there's component-model.bytecodealliance.org, and then of course there's the GitHub repos. And um, if you just go through the various repos, it's like, oh my god, there's so much super valuable code. And um, if you look at it, it's like, oh wait, this is all open source um, with a permissive license. So who is who is sponsoring this work? Is it the Bytecode Alliance members, um, like the big brands you see on the, on the main website? If you go there, then there's a bunch of really big uh, company websites. Like, is it those companies that uh, financed uh, the Bytecode Alliance? Yeah, so um, in terms of open source foundations, the joining fees for companies is pretty low compared to, uh, let's say, like other projects, Linux Foundation um, style projects. The the cost per size of company is, is fairly low for the membership fee, but that actually doesn't um, it doesn't impact your ability to contribute. So 
Uh, we have a number of recognized contributors that do this on the weekend, not as part of their day job. A shout out to Dave Bakker. You are awesome, sir. Um, and uh, there are uh, um, some companies that do significantly more implementation work than others uh, that are on, um, on, on the membership page. Uh, I, I would say generally, yes. Um, most of those projects that you see are from uh, companies that have a deep investment in WebAssembly and are funding engineering engineers to work on those projects. Um, it's not the case that the Bytecode Alliance pays any engineers to, to do projects. Uh, we use those funds to support like um, all of our CI and fuzz and infrastructure and being able to run events. Um, are some of the examples of, of what we use membership fees for, but um, we we have a lot of folks that uh, are are dependent on these projects as well that are are big large orgs, um, and sometimes they have engineers available, and so we've you know we we I really loved it when we had uh, our VMware before um, they were acquired by Broadcom they had a couple engineers cycle in and do uh, WebAssembly gar garbage collection implementation within Wasm tools and Wasm time, which was awesome <laughs> to have. So that type of like, again, it's it's about relationships in, in open source and us uh, saying we had this need and talking to the folks that were part of the Bytecode Alliance and them being able to show up with, with engineers and a timeline for, for when they're able to invest really helps us move a lot of the work forward. And um, if I am a corporation and I'm on the membership board um, of the Bytecode Alliance, and I have this interesting problem that I want to sponsor, but um, for whatever reason, I decide to make my license a non-permissive license, like uh, the GNU license, for example, that is still open source, but it, it's not permissive in a sense that um, many corporations could use it. Is this something that could then happen in the Bytecode Alliance, or do you have licensing um, requirements that the license needs to be permissive? We do have licensing requirements. Essentially, it's Apache 2 with the LLVM exception for all projects within the Bytecode Alliance, unless there's a board level exception. But that board level exception would be, a, for example, for something that's MIT that we've brought in uh, that we wouldn't be changing the license for, but or, or having a dual license type situation for that is more common. Um, so no, <laughs> short answer is no. If, you, if you're using a project in the Bytecode Alliance, you can be rest assured that it's using a well-known and permissive license that is corporation friendly. And I guess that's very good news for corporations, but also for just in general open source developers. Um, because yeah, it just frees us from, from being uh, worried about like, oh, am I gonna get in trouble if I build my company upon this? Or maybe something starts as a side project and then you decide, um, hey, I wanna build a business about, uh, about this. And I'm not um, wanting to release any of my source code, which there's valid reasons for doing so. Um, but yeah, you can then, of course, still build upon all of those um, tools that you can find in the various Bytecode Alliance repos. So cool, that's that's really good news. Um, cool, um, this brings us to the last uh, part of the show, which is always Vasm but not, which gives us and uh, like essentially everyone listening and watching this uh, an opportunity to get to know our guests from a different angle that is not Vasm, like we talked about. So um, Bailey, um, when you instantiate streaming on any of your streaming devices, what is it that you currently watch or listen to? I am currently listening to a book in the Mistborn Saga by Brandon Sanderson. It's called The Hero of Ages. Uh, I'm a big time Audible listener. Um, I uh, That is definitely, if I'm streaming something, it's probably that or podcasts. Um, and I think part of that is because I have two dogs and I take that time to listen and walk with them on, around my neighborhood. Yeah, like uh, you need some sort of commute, you need to have some sort of obligation because yeah, there's like listening to a book is quite a commitment. Um, I never got to listen to books, like got into listening to books. It's just the reading is too slow. The uh, the emphasis is too much like on making, um, I don't know, funny voices and stuff. So I don't like, it doesn't catch up with me. Do you, do you like that? I I didn't like it until I got to the point where I can listen at 2x. And I reach this place of deep focus on it because I have to really pay attention to understand what they're saying when you've got the speed crank so high. 
Uh, and that feeling of like deep focus and flow is just amazing, it's super relaxing. So if you've, and I, it took me over several months, like Audible lets you do it by hundredths of uh, a decimal point. So you can very slowly crank this up over time to the point where you can get it very, very fast. And so um, I go a little bonkers now though, because you know, in real life, everybody's so slow. Uh, I know that I talk kind of fast because I probably sound like the podcasts and things that I listen to, but um, it, even conference talks, like I, I love uh, going to WasmCon and KubeCon and all those, but I usually stay in the hallway track so that later I can watch the YouTube videos and crank that way on up. It's funny to say that because I'm just like that. Um, I was listening to a podcast on regular speed um, yesterday because for some reason uh, YouTube didn't show the um, the speed toggle um, YouTube music um, that has podcast integrated now since Google has decided to retire the uh, dedicated podcast app that we had. So anyways, um, I was listening to this podcast and it was, as you said, just so slow and people were like making jokes. <laughs> like once you come, uh, you, you are gone uh, like double speed or 1.5, which is typically what I do. Um, there's no going back. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if there's one thing that you could local get and then a global set on the world, um, what would it be? I would say assume positive intent. Um, I think that's a, a hard lesson that I continue to learn, um, especially working in the open source communities. Folks think that things are done, um, you know, either dumbly or they didn't consider that use case or they um, only care about their thing and not your thing um, or comments in a code review maybe come off a little harsh. Um, and if you take a step back and say, oh, well, what would be the, you know, what would be the most charitable thing uh, for what they were doing there? It makes the world a better place. <laughs> um, and, and you really can start to understand because People who are interacting and working in open source, they're doing it because they are passionate about what they're working on, because they deeply care. And open source is about the community that you're working in, which means they care a lot about you. <laughs> they care that you're, use you're using their project or they wouldn't be uh, doing the work. And uh, so I think being able to step back and assume positive intent is the thing that I would love everybody to, um, to adopt. Uh, and I guess, the reverse side of that is I would love it if everybody thanked a maintainer uh, at least once a week um, because they do a ton of work that is very thankless and they definitely know when they broke you, but they don't always know when things just work. So uh, please thank your friendly maintainer of your favorite project. Oh, yes. 100% yes. I can totally subscribe to everything you said there. Um, and then especially as myself, as a non-native speaker, sometimes you pick up idioms, idioms, but you don't really super know how to apply them. And then you try to apply them and it's like, oh, you didn't quite miss, uh, you didn't quite uh, get how, how you say that properly. <laughs> sometimes people, uh, yeah, just write something that they would just say in the native language, but then uh, translated to English, it just doesn't come across well. Um, there's how direct versus how indirect do you need to be when, when you interact with someone? So yeah, totally agree. Uh, everything you said there is super important. Um, please thank your open source maintainer and assume good intents. And I think this also applies universally, not just to the world of open source and uh, code reviews and stuff, but just in general, if you, if you talk to someone in the real world, <laughs> assuming good intent, best intentions is probably uh, safe advice there. Awesome. Um, cool. So Bailey, um, people who want to follow your work, um, are you on any of the social networks? Like what, what do you use? Can people reach out if they have questions? Yeah, I'm on Hackyderm as Ricochet Code. Uh, I think that's probably one of the easiest ones to count, contact me on. Um, as you said earlier, I do run a monthly uh, community stream. That's uh, the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, and that's on the YouTube channel for Bike Code Alliance. Uh, and that is just trying to give a, a round of updates. And um, part of that is I, I run uh, at the end of a series of updates, I do a spotlight on a contributor or project within the Bike Code Alliance. Uh, for other places, I am technically on X and, you know, I am a CTO, so I am on LinkedIn, so you can catch me there. Um, but, you know, if you're an engineer, catch me on Hackyderm. I like that one the best. 
So that's uh, Mastodon. And that's one of the terms I saw a lot, but I never heard it pronounced. So I always assume something like Ashidelm or something like that. So French. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hackyderm, that's how you say it. So yeah, Mastodon, definitely the place to be um, for reaching you. Um, but yeah, if, if people want to get uh, onto Twitter, onto LinkedIn, they can also find you. Um, awesome. So thank you so much for being on the show today, uh, Bailey. Um, for the Batman Assembly podcast, if you have any feedback on like the length, um, because we talked about listening to uh, 1.5x speed. Um, <laughs> one hour typically is what we clock in, um, which is a commitment. But if you listen to 1.5 speed, it's a little faster. If you listen to double speed, it's only half an hour. So um, if you have feedback on the length, Length, um, just reach out. Also, if you want to be the next uh, Bailey on the on the show, the next guest on the show, um, if you have something interesting to say about WebAssembly, um, definitely also be sure to reach out. Um, you know how to reach myself and Tomayak on all the social networks, but as Bailey, I use Mastodon as my main social network these days. <laughs> but if if you want to reach me on LinkedIn, I also respond there. I just may not see it on day one. Awesome. So thanks again, Bailey, for being on the show. And um, we all will see and listen to you next time. Bye-bye.